Okay. Just the agenda for the, this morning. Um, we're going to just spend some time um, to have a nice breakfast now. During that time, I'm just going to do a short intro of CityGates and what we do and why we do it. And I'm going to call up Pastor Ross to just share a bit of our heart around this. And then I'll introduce our guest speakers for the morning, and then we'll have a great panel discussion around the theme, business as usual, or let's say business as unusual. I think 2020 um, gave us that relevancy to have business as unusual and to see how we're going to navigate that going forward. Right. So without any further ado, let's um, maybe just close the eyes and pray for, for the food. Lord, we just want to thank you for your grace on our lives, Lord. Thank you that we have the privilege to, to gather together this morning um, as, as friends, as colleagues, as um, professionals in, in our fields. Lord, just to, to network and to connect with you and how you do business, Father, and what you've put in our hearts, Father, and just listen to, to stories, Father, real-life stories of of, of what you've done and what you're still doing, Lord. And I ask that you, you bless this food to our bodies, Lord, and um, that this morning will just be, bring glory to your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Those of you who were here last time, you would have heard this. I'm going to keep it shorter. But basically, we started City Gates during the lockdown. We just realized, you know, there's such a big need for small business owners to just have an area where, where there's support. Uh, we all know as entrepreneurs, it could be a very lonely journey. So we just said it's a community of business owners. It's an environment of collaboration and support. Uh, we establish and grow impactful or guys who want to um, establish and grow impactful businesses in the local community for the local community. Um, it's great if you're building a scalable global business, but our focus is really here in our local community. Um, and the image on your left is just our whole belief around growing in Christ, growing in community, growing with our neighbors, growing in ourselves, growing with others and in our work and with God on this journey. So at this point, I would like to introduce Pastor Ross, um, our head pastor at, at Shofar Durbanville, and he's just going to share a bit of um, our heart behind City Gates. Ross. Okay. Mia Yaku, I'm so proud of what you're doing. Um, I know that they grow group. I see some of the people in this grow group every week. Uh, they're really enjoying it, and it's good to be here. So when we, when we talk about... Um, about work, church and work. I've been in ministry nearly 20 years, and I've just seen that over the years that the relationship between church and business, church and businessmen and women is a bit strained many times. Um, and I think the big reason is that there's a big divide in our heads when it comes to, when it comes to business and when it comes to, to, to religious life. And how I see it played out in a few ways, the first one, I see that many times people think, and I've heard this in boardrooms with other pastors together, and I've seen this, in, heard this in conversations with Christian businessmen, and I hear that they say that the purpose in life is to make money for the kingdom. You know, have you, have you heard that before? You know, maybe you've said that before. The purpose of the work is to make money for the kingdom. And I've seen the other side as well. I've seen that people don't just go to work to make money for the kingdom, but I've seen people go to work to, to extend the church services to their workplace. So that the idea is, as a Christian businessman, what it means is I preach and I get my colleagues to pray together. So I extend ministry to church. And, and the question I've been struggling with, and last year I had interviews with about 25 working professionals, and I had long-term conversations with them, and I tried to discern, and this is the question that I asked them. I asked them, so what does your work have to do with the kingdom of God? Now, it obviously defines on how you see the kingdom of God. You know, if the kingdom of God is heaven one day far, far away, so then the only, only important, yes, then the only important thing for you to do is to get people there, you know, either by funding it <laughs> or by praying, ministering into it. But if God is truly busy reconciling all things to himself, if God in Christ has created all things for himself, that he is in all things and he wants to reconcile all people and all things to himself, 
then I think we understand that if God created you as a worker, man who's created in his image, in relationship to work, to keep and cultivate the earth, to preserve and to cultivate wealth. If, if that is indeed what your work is about, then I want to say that, that your work in itself, the business in itself, the working community in itself, cultivating the earth, wealth creation and preservation in itself is godly, is good. And I think if you want to ask, just I think in the situation that we're panning now, what does God want to do in South Africa? <laughs> if the kingdom comes to South Africa now, if Jesus as reigning king returns now and establishes his reign now, what would, what would, sell, what would be the things that he changes? Then I say, surely people will be able to work safely and feed their families. Then I'm saying, man, my heart and my prayer is that you, that you prosper in your businesses. And even in the conversations that Yaku and myself have had, you know, the, the business and church relationship communities is so strange. But if we can somehow, in city gates, if somehow we can, we can build a trust relationship that, <clears throat> that it's never about getting money from your businesses, but all about you fulfilling your purpose and being empowered to do what God called you to do and to support, to create a supporting role, community for you and an empowering community that you actually flourish for God's sake. That your business, that you will be the best in your business that you can be, that you'll be able to inspire others, build others, create meaningful GDP, but wealth and also services to the community. If, like Paul, when Paul speaks, it's amazing, when Paul speaks in Thessalonians about work, what does he say? It's two things, he say, guys, Jesus is coming back soon, Jesus is coming back soon. And then the first thing that he says is, he says, so stop being lazy, work. And you think that doesn't make sense. I mean, if Jesus comes back soon, then why should I work at all? But it's, if your idea is that Jesus is gonna take you far, far away to sit in the cloud and do nothing, to sit in a bubble bath and smoke weed and drink champagne, chill out in heaven with harps playing around you. If that is your idea of nirvana, <laughs> of heaven, then, then surely. But, but if God simply comes to restore what he did with Adam and Eve, to create him as a friend, someone to relate to, someone to entrust the earth to, to cultivate community, to cultivate wealth, to do business, to, to, to take out of nothing something, if that is what God has called you to do, then I want to say that let's create an environment for that. Let me just, Yaku asked me for 10 seconds just to put City Gates image on there. Not the City Gates image, that, that image, that one. Um, I, I, many of you have heard this, so just allow me to say it again. This, is, this has been in my top of my head for the past two years. Heard it many a long time ago, read a book on it, but now it stays in my head the whole time, especially now during the, this, this crisis, economic work crisis that our country is going in, but it's more than that. It's Lauren Cunningham and Bill Gates, 1970, Bill Gates, Bill Bright, no, maybe he was there as well. Lauren Cunningham and Bill Bright, 1975, heydays of the youth missions movement with the Jesus movement, um, student missions movement. The two of them got together, and then I'm going to make it really short, but leading up, one in the morning, one in the evening, just before they came to the meeting, the Lord gave a word to Lauren Cunningham to give to Bill Bright. And he said to him, say to Bill, my friend, that if you want to disciple nations, say to the head of Campus Crusade for Christ, just at the heydays, if you want to disciple nations, this is what you want to do. If you want to disciple nations, then God says this. You're going to have to do more than pray the sinner's prayer. If you want to disciple a nation, you're going to have to conquer seven mountains of culture, the influences of culture. You're going to have to instruct on how does family life work? How does business life work in the kingdom of God? How does government work? How does education work? How does media marketing work? And he took the seven mountains up there. He wrote it down on a yellow paper. You can Google this. He will share their own story on himself. He said to his friend, uh, and, and when he came to the table, as they started having their lunch, he took out his paper and he said, this is what the Lord said. I have a word from the Lord for me. And as he took out his yellow paper, Bill, Bill's eyes rose. He says, no way. And he took he, out of his jacket a white paper and says, the Lord gave a word to you. And the word was exactly the same thing. Bill said, seven mountains. Lauren said, seven mountains. Bill said, seven gates. If you want to influence a nation, if you want to 
win a nation over for Christ, you're going to have to influence and possess seven gates in society, seven influential spheres. So one of them is the business world, and some of you are working in the media and marketing world. The reality is quite simply this, that the kingdom of God is not far, far away. The kingdom of God is not just about prayer. The kingdom of God is about reorganizing, renewal, re reconciling a society to himself with kingdom values. So I really want to say this is my passion, my prayer for you. And what we're trying to cultivate in this space, create a space in this, it, for now it's inside the church building because we don't have to pay, because you're already paying for it. Thank you so much. <laughs> for now it's in here because it just makes sense. Wherever this is, the heart is, can we not worry about anything but empowering you to, for God's sake, fulfill your purpose to serve society selflessly with the gifts that you have, to cultivate wealth, to cultivate power, to cultivate the ability for people to live, to create spheres like that. So that's really the heart behind City Gates, in short, when it comes down to come to our prayer time. Thank you, Yaku. Okay. It's actually amazing just listening to what Ross said now and having a quick conversation with Quibus beforehand, and he pretty much summed up that's what, they did in, what they're doing in the business. They, they're conquering education, to a certain extent, family, um, obviously business. So, so it's really inspiring. So I'm looking forward to, to bringing that, them on stage now. Hopefully you guys are eating. Please don't, don't wait, especially the speakers. If you haven't had your food, I think it's a good idea to do that now while I'm introducing you. Okay. So our first speaker that I would like to introduce is Rizal Johansson. Um, many of you in the congregation know her well. Um, Okay. I'm going to read their, their, their profiles because I think it's, it's just a special, you know, because we, th that's what authenticity is all about. That, that's what you are all about, and I, and I love that. So if you want to know, get to know Rizal a little bit better, Rizal Johansson's desire to see people reach their full potential in life and business, gain traction after school when she studied psychology and completed her degree. Since then, Rizal has worked in various industries, including FPOs, NPOs in both corporate and SME businesses, primarily in people-centered roles such as human resources and people development. Rizal has continued with her passion and today spends most of her time in ID3 with her husband Shane there at the back. Um, now I lost my place. Okay. Rizal has designed and streamlined various people processes and initiatives within both the NPO and business world. Some notable achievements that stand out are the design and implementation, the first FSC employment equity tracking system for RMB Private Bank, being part of a cross-functional team who won an innovation award at FNB, um, the most innovative bank in the world at that time, and winning a competition for the best people engagement process aligned um, to her division strategy in private banking. Um, on our Facebook page, you can see the rest of it. Um, some interesting facts about Rizal that I would like to light out. Um, lead a team who won the Guinness World Record for biggest structure built with tins. I think that's a great accomplishment. Um, she co-published a play at workbook. I had the privilege of doing my MBA at Stellenbosch in 2018. I didn't realize at the time that it was Rizal that actually came to present that book to us, um, and it was such a great experience to bring in gamification, playing, just doodling, doing things that you don't normally think about in the workspace. Um, and in our chats now recently, I only realized it was actually Rizal who brought her book to an academ academic institution um, that's world-renowned, that's got a triple crown accreditation um, as a business school, so really well done on that, Rizal. Um, and there's a few others, so I'm, I'm going to leave you to go to our Facebook page and go read more on Rizal or just have a chat to her afterwards. Now we get to Quibbers. Right, so Quibbers, um, Lo, the founder and, and CEO um, of, of Digimi, um, after completing his honors degree in mathematical science, um, at the University of Stellenbosch, Quibbers pursued a career in credit risk, where he later became a specialist in credit risk modeling, um, while building models that forecast consumer behavior for some of the biggest banks in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Africa. He realized that there is a, a very little being done to change this behavior. 
With his modeling expertise and passion for education, mentorship, and leadership development, he founded Digime.com, an edtech company that uses algorithms to continuously measure a learner's knowledge on a subject and create tailored learning curves that repeats the right information to the learner over time, optimizing and automating the learning process. Really, I think, so relevant in, in the time that we that we live in. Digimi specializes in performance optimization, financial wellness, entrepreneurial development, and soft skill development in the B2B and B2C markets, and under Quibus's leadership, has grown to one of the leading tech startups in Africa, winning an MTN Business App of the Year Award in 2018, and was crowned the second best tech startup in Africa, according to Africa Tech Week in 2019. Quibus is extremely passionate about kingdom business, South Africa and its people, and has made it his life goal, purpose, and conviction to change the continent through scalable education. So that's just some of the awards that they won, and um, some of the features that they've been on uh, in the public media recently. Then last but definitely not least, Johan de Prier from Saad Investment Holdings. Johan, I took this from your website, so I hope it's updated. <laughs> um, Johan is an experienced CEO and is well known for his turnaround expertise and is the founder of Saad Investment Holdings and the Tree of Life Foundation. Johan began his career in the USA, California in 1991, where he specialized in the turnaround of large retail drug stores for American drug stores. Um, a retail group that owned more than 700 stores. Um, he then moved on to manage healthcare, medical insurance, and risk management, and was part of a core team that created the National Claims Processor, um, Rx America, allowing pharmacies to submit their claims to medical insurers online and in real time via satellite link. Upon his return to South Africa, Upon his return to South Africa, he was instrumental in the turnaround of Sunlam Health. Um, uh, he was the health insurance CEO 1999 to 2001, led Glacier by Su Sunlam, um, CEO 2002 to 2004, and headed up the startup of the financing company, Quinn's Capital, um, also the CEO 2006 to 2009. He acted as the CEO of the then Jay-Z listed pharmaceutical company, Cipla Medpro. Um, August 2012 to June 2013, and during this time concluded a 4.5 billion rand transaction with Cipla India that saw the delisting de of Cipla Medpro. During his involvement with the Sunlam Group, he served on the executive committee of Sunlam Life and Sunlam Investment Management. Johan obtained the degree MPharm in 1989 at Pretoria and holds an MBA from National University in San Diego, California. Uh, some of Jan's other leadership roles includes um, a serving board member for a number of entities, which include uh, the chairman of the Tree of Life Foundation, the chairman of Grassroots uh, Group Holdings, is a board member of Innovo Telecom, board member of Pargo, uh, board member of Power Group Holdings, Think Capital Investment and TrustBridge Global in Switzerland. So I think you would all agree with me, we are very privileged to have these three guest speakers with us this morning, so I want to welcome the three of you on the stage. Okay, thank you very much for making time, we really appreciate it. So, as with last time, the idea is not to have a very formal discussion, the idea is to really to, to bring forth real, real life, real stories, and just share out of the heart. So I'm just going to shoot with a few questions and you guys can decide who goes first and just uh, we have a nice discussion. Okay. So first of all, um, question to all three of you, just tell us a little bit more besides the stuff that I told them now. Who are you? Um, a little bit of your background and how, just how you started out as an entrepreneur. I know all of you have different backgrounds and how you got into entrepreneurship. So the ladies first. <laughs> um, okay, in ten words or less. <laughs> um, sure. Okay, so I, I grew up, my dad had his own business, so I probably grew up most of my life making garage doors <laughs> and doing holidays. And if I wasn't doing that, I was helping my aunt doing sort of accounting work. Um, but I studied psychology and 
kind of as life leads leads me or led me, I ended up working for an institution called Micro MBA, which was a um, a grassroots uh, sort of training people how to do run their own businesses. And I guess spending so much time running your own business, um, I then decided, well, it was time for me to venture into doing my own thing. And I joined, uh, Shane and I started our own business at that time, but I think we, well, certainly I had great dreams, well, we both had great dreams, and I think there was not, not enough headspace. <laughs> <laughs> and not enough maturity at that time. So we were probably fighting for headspace and clients and all the rest. <laughs> anyway, I, I had a dream besides that um, was sort of a baby in the briefcase dream. So I then decided to do the briefcase thing and went into corporate and spent a number of years in banking um, in the HR space. Um, had had our first boy, um, and then through a series of events, after I had Hannah, I also had just had a desire to go back into business with Shane. And um, ID3 was growing at the time. And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to kind of re-enter ID3. And so did that about five years ago. I wanted to say age before beauty, but after COVID, I might look even <laughs> older than you. But anyway. <laughs> um, I was thrown into entrepreneurship from a very young age. I started my first business when I was in Standard 7. And I did computer hardware and software for friends, fools, and family. And then I went to um, university, and that trumped my entrepreneurial spirit drastically. And um, while in university, I focused on anything but academics. And uh, after I went into the credit risk space, basically because... I didn't really know what else I was going to do. Um, I studied financial mathematics, and I wasn't fundamentally called into it. It just happened. So I think my life is very much always God just being there and leading me into the right directions. And I always say God can't move a ship that's standing still. You have to move, you know. And I think a lot of times we're standing still and we ask God, what must I do? What must I do? But we don't move. So I just kept on moving throughout my life. And... Obviously, you make mistakes and you go on. I started about seven businesses by the time I was 26. Um, in, I had an Uber company, I had an Airbnb company, I had a construction company, I had a woodworking workshop in Epping, I had a car workshop in Athlone. And um, the one thing I realized from everything we're busy with is that um, balance does not breed brilliance. Focus breeds brilliance. And that in everything that I was busy with, it wasn't at all got to do with kingdom-focused business. It was all to do with myself. My heart was absolutely rotten. It obviously still is. I'm working on that. It's a constant journey. But um, fundamentally, why do you start a business? And that why behind business was never there for me. And literally, our God just started moving in my life and made things happen. It's I still, if I think about it now, it's literally just God moving and me responding, and that's how Digimi happened. It was idea, and then, I mean, we raised funds from pitching the, the project to a, f a fund, and I mean, Friedrich Meisner sitting there working for business partners, I think he understands this game very well. From pitch to funding took two weeks. That process usually takes nine months to a year if you're lucky, through due diligence, everything. So, I mean, I literally got a feeling God said to me, um, go contact our, our seed fund, and I haven't spoken to him in five years. And I thought the, the, the conversation is going to be about property. And I found myself, I've got this great idea in property, and I went to go sit with him, and he said, excellent, but I'm, I'm not interested in property anymore. If you've got, you know anybody that's got good ideas that they want to scale in tech, just let me know. And we were then busy playing around with this idea about education and seeing how can we change education in Africa. It's always been a, a, a passion of mine. I was very fortunate to be mentored by a guy called Kevin Horsley. He's currently a two times world memory champion. He's one of the six grand grandmasters of memory in the world, um, Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and uh, number one on Amazon business books currently. And he mentored me on a, a me I was fascinated about memory and retention and speed reading and focus. And through that journey, I realized that I can actually take his model and create a scalable automated platform that facilitates the learning journey and helps people overcome learning difficulties. Because it's mostly just a mindset. The enemy comes in and lies to us and tells us, 
who we are and what we are and what our incapability is, and we start believing that. So our whole journey is about breaking down those mindsets that keep people from growing. Hosea 6 verse 4 says, my people go under because of their lack of knowledge. And obviously, yes, that's mostly spiritual and focused on, on the kingdom. But I think there's a very big component to that. It's, uh, you know, what do we actually physically conquer on earth? What knowledge do we possess? And how do we actually apply that in our everyday lives? And our purpose is to become the world's best performance-focused learning company. And that means if I learn something, I then apply it and I start nurturing it in my life and I start growing it in my life. So regardless of what space it is, we then decided, well, that's exactly what we're going to be and that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to scale education, be it university space, be it in the school space, be it in organizational space. We're going to bring quality education to the last person in Africa. Awesome. Thanks. Kubis. Johan. Hey, great to be with you this morning. So, so I um, grew up in Northwest Province, um, rural. Uh, I don't know why I studied pharmacy. I, that's probably the only profession I knew about at that stage, but I did. So my experience is um, similar to what Quibus has mentioned, that God, you know, um, not a very calculated or a career path planning process, but just flowing with God and just discovering. I, I always say I made the best decisions based on what I did not know. And, um, and uh, you know, when, you, when you're acting on conviction, but with little evidence, and everyone's path is different, right? So in terms of business, that's my path. I really don't know that much. I'm not a CA or whatever. I'm a pharmacist. And I can count tablets, and then I can count money, I guess, at the same time. So, so it's, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, just a process. So what pharmacy did do for me, though, is I, um, I met my wife, which was worth all the organic chemistry. And <laughs> still, still, still the best transaction of my life. Um, 32 years later, and um, yeah, and the, and the other thing I'll say is, one discover your, your what your what makes you tick, right, in terms of business and entrepreneurship. Also by seeing what you have paid for, that's always a dead giveaway for me. If they if they bring someone in a, a wheelchair through that door now, I'm not going to run forward to pray for that person. Not because I don't believe God can heal the person. I know God can do anything, but I don't have a natural faith for that. But if you bring a sick business through the door, then I have natural faith for that. And I haven't decided that I want faith for that, but, it's, but I think it's always a giveaway. If you know you like something, you have faith for a business, you have faith for a success in a business, then, then that, that is a guideline. Sure. Um, what, what really stands out for me is we, you guys, um, Quibus, I know you know practices material really well. And we, we're using that in our grow group. Um, and the first session in, in practices sessions is that creative anointing, that creative creativity that God has given us to, to really just something is put in our hearts. And what I hear from all three of you is literally it was not that massively calculated 60 page business plan that was set out and, and then you started moving it was literally something that was deposited in your heart and a natural flow from your skill set your experience uh, something you've got faith you had faith for which is really inspiring and i think it's just a nice takeaway for for maybe many of you or for myself as well is if that thing is is, is cemented in your heart Take the courage, take the faith, and and start start praying about it and start moving on it. We just had, had that discussion last night at the Grow Group as well, so it's just confirming that. Thank you for that. So the second one is obviously we had a very interesting 2020. Um, many people say we should just remove it from the calendar and have 2019 going into 2021, um, but amidst this very difficult, uncertain uh, environment. Um, and very people, a lot of people just say, yeah, it's so difficult, it's so difficult. But amidst all the difficulties, all the uncertainties, there's obviously a lot of opportunity as well. So my question to you guys is, during the national lockdown, during COVID-19, that's really hit a lot of businesses hard. Uh, did you guys go on as normal? Um, how did you approach it? Uh, did it affect you? And, and sort of just how did you as an entrepreneur during this pandemic, during this uncertainty, how did you approach it firstly and how did you sort of navigate through it up to up to this point? Okay, so we uh, reverse order, right? Eh? Um, so we invest in businesses, um, so we see a number of businesses, we have a portfolio of businesses that we invest in and obviously they're all over the place. Some were 
um, positively affected by COVID, some were negatively affected by COVID. Um, so let's focus on the generic stuff, I think, in terms of, of something like COVID. The beauty of something like COVID is it always takes you back to basics. You know, when you, when you hit some rough waters, then you suddenly have to remember the basics again. And that's very liberating. Um, and, and with those basics in a situation like this, just like what we had in the credit crunch in 2008-9 and now again, is you, what you don't want to do is with the next crisis go in it again and with the same risk factors. <laughs> because risk factors like debt and other you know, uh, stuff is what kills you in a situation like that. So you actually want to make notes in a situation like this and say, well, with the next crisis, I, I want to have eliminated some risk factors. And then uh, we would just work with the businesses that we invested in to say, well, what are the basics, you know? Um, your business plan may have to change, but your values don't ever change, right? So, so focus on the stuff that's, that, that won't change and, and work with that. So we may have to sell this rather than that, but we'll do it with the same integrity that we've done before. Um, communicate 10 times more than you think is necessary. Um, uh, and, and, and cash is important. You have to think about cash. It's the oxygen of business. And in um, and, and these times, you need to make sure that you have enough oxygen to get through the storm. So there's just a few top of mind um, issues in terms of, of what we're currently experiencing. It's not working. Oh, excellent. Culture, we, we so... F fundamentally focused on culture. Everybody speaks about culture and values and culture and values. Um, but it's amazing that something like COVID taught us what our real values are. And the amazing thing about pressure is if you crank up pressure in any environment and the, the, the pipes are running at 150%, it shows you where the cracks are. And that's an amazing thing. In any business, the best thing that can happen to a business is either going through a massive growth stint where you're running so fast that your feet can't move anymore, or you go through a crisis where your oxygen dries up because it shows you what your leadership qualities are. It shows you what the, the culture is in your business. And the values in that business essentially drives the culture. So regardless of whether you're going through a crisis or whether things are going well in your business, I think we should always lead our businesses with the same focus. And this was something I learned as part of the Trigger Accelerator, which is absolutely incredible. But you must high and fire according to values. If your values if you can say you have a kingdom-focused business, but if you don't have kingdom-focused or Christ-like values, then you can't really say you've got a kingdom-focused business because what is your business built on? So if you are living those values, the most amazing thing was stabilizing team and making a hard decision that we're not going to make any salary cuts. At the beginning of COVID, our recurring revenue as a percentage of OPEX was around 150%. Now, for a, for a tech startup, that's exactly what investors want to hear. If I'm going to throw money into this pipeline, if I give you one rand, you're going to give me more than one rand back. Um, when COVID hit, within one week, our recurring revenue as a percentage of OPEX dropped to 10%. So we were in big trouble. We were bleeding. Our oxygen was drying up. And amazing things like just sustained obedience in what you're currently busy doing. God told me to sell me. I was literally standing there at a business pitch two years ago, and God told me to sell me all my properties. And I didn't know why. And I was like, this is the stupidest thing I can do. The market is down, doesn't make sense. And I just did it. I was, I was obedient and literally took about a year to sell those properties because of the market. And if I did not do that, I literally had put money in my pocket, which I could use to sustain my business through COVID. If I was disobedient and I started arguing with God about why it doesn't make business sense, then we would have been dead. We wouldn't have been able to raise money or you would have raised and you go through a down round. Um, so for us, I mean, it, it showed us that nobody can predict the future, right? But in any business, there's two main things. It's product and distribution. And the only thing that really changed during COVID is distribution, either to a different client or pivoting your business to make your product work in a different environment. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing business, you want to sell something that drives value. If you focus on the value, then the money will follow. If I'm changing something or I'm changing a need, well, I'm changing something in my environment, obviously better yet if it's kingdom focused and I'm actually edifying something that is broken, redeeming something that is broken, then the money will follow. So for us in COVID, we realized, well, we've got so much business to business exposure and because of that, now all the funding dried out. 
So where else can we focus? And God brought absolutely incredible opportunity for us. We're actually in the process of starting the first full curriculum um, IEB adaptive learning high school in Africa. Um, and in that, entrenching God's values in terms of leadership, it's not just academically focused, it's focused on uh, what is the godly leadership principles, what uh, memory focus, um, retention, reading, financial literacy, entrepreneurial development, the things that people actually need, plus an absolute amazing academic overlay. And how do we, then we realize that if we don't, if we are entrenching God's values in the world, then the value, the value will be given and value being given is a leading indicator of money that follows. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> you, you, you're not going to get off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> my adrenaline's going, oh. <laughs> Shane did all of that. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think for me, you know, um, my heart's pumping now. I'm like, oh dear. Um, I think my experience of COVID was, oh Lord. And I just, I, um, I think Shane kept the big picture. I just went into denial, which is clearly what change does with people. So it's interesting. We do, we, we help people go through change, you know, so we teach them this is not what you can expect, et cetera, et cetera. So when COVID kind of hit and I was, I remember sitting outside on our little patio and I was like, this isn't happening. And I just threw myself into work because, you know, that I can control. And I remember thinking, oh, my word, I'm on the denial part of this sort of um, grief cycle. And, um, and I, I knew it. And it was, I was quite happy to be in that space. So I just went on and, you know, I'm like churning out products and churning out stuff. And I'm just, you know, and... Um, so I'm not sure this is answering the business as usual, but but things were not as usual for me. The kids were home, and it was like, oh, my word. And we teach people that if you're going through change, you need to anchor yourself because everything's fluctuating, so you anchor. But here, everything was not changing because we were all stuck at home. And I was like, oh, you're looking at the same faces over and over and trying to, you know. So, <laughs> so um like all of those things, even what we teach people in this situation wasn't really working because the normal things that you'd anchor, you almost didn't, you wanted to disrupt that because you just didn't initially, or certainly I didn't want to look at just the same faces all the time and just throw myself into work. So um, so this is probably more a personal take on, on the business. Um, what happened certainly to me in this time, besides doing some really good work, I kind of lifted my head after also going through bargaining because that's also I kind of this isn't happening and this is how it should be and trying to push the boundaries in our complex around what could happen and what couldn't happen. Um, so this is not necessarily business related, but then also going through anger, you know, is this, you know, doubting whether this is all real. Um, anyway... So business definitely wasn't as usual. We had clients basically saying to us, they, we, I think they thought it was only going to last a month. So they said, we're not going to, we, we'll postpone, see what happens in a month's time. And, um, and then we obviously had to just change our tack and um, do online stuff, um, which worked well. But what we also found is that where we were, our training focus changed to becoming more around wellness and resilience, which is part of what we teach in, in change and leadership is how to manage that. Um, so we found ourselves obviously living in that space and having to deal with that, or certainly I did a lot more around the, the anxiety around what's going to happen, how is this going to be, and, and having to lean into to Jesus more, which is a good thing. Um, so a lot changed certainly for, for me and I guess for Shane as well. And having the kids at home was, it, it was comforting knowing that they were close, but it was also just the adjustment of having to balance that. And I guess when I lifted my head from the denial um, and having thrown myself so much in work, I kind of realized how almost disconnected from my emotions I'd become. Uh, and that was quite an interesting one. Um, and almost running on empty, even though 
we had all of this time and stuff, I wasn't willing to almost go to what was happening in my heart. <laughs> so throwing myself into work and then kind of coming up for breath and realizing, oh my word, I'm with the people that I love and we're all feeling so disconnected because I wasn't really bringing my heart. So I think that for me in terms of business and then also understanding that our clients are going through that, I think was a good thing because then we could also tailor our interactions with them to say, these are the things that we're experiencing and how do you, because a lot of our clients are corporate and they're also kind of at home. And I remember speaking to one of the ladies and she said there's, her kids were also at home and she says there's blood on the floor downstairs, you know. <laughs> so I said, yes, I understand that. Um, so, so I think we were fortunate enough to, to exp like kind of experience the raw reality of the discomfort and being able to then tailor what we're doing to, to meet our clients' needs. Um, does that, I think that answers your question. Yeah, brilliant, thanks. Now, I think the three things that really st st stands out for me is, firstly, I think the back to basics thing, just to really go back to the core of what we know is important um, in these times. Um, Kubis, you mentioned the whole thing of, of obedience, and it just made me think of, of um, uh, Angus Buchan's story of when he had to sell all his ox, uh, all the Angus, Angus ox that he had, and he didn't understand because he had this amazing um, farm full of um, Angus, Angus um, ox, and uh, the Lord just said, you, you have to sell, and he didn't understand. I don't know if you know the story, and he just obeyed blindly um, and, and he sold it off. And that just shortly after that, I think, that what's the, what was that sickness? Malqui sickta or what? Yeah, um, broke out and, and he would have lost everything. But just being in that place, understanding that, listen, yes, there's this whole analytical side of things and uh, facing the brutal realities and, and we should do that. And that's actually my third thing. But just to be in that place where we can say, listen, up, be obedient. I don't understand it now. It doesn't make sense necessarily uh, academically or analytically, but I'm just going to pursue that. And it's what, what you guys have done. And just with the school standing up and everything, that's really inspiring. So thank you for that. And I think also what you said is just not shying away from the emotion, shying away from where you as a person is during a time of change, but navigating that. And, and I think that sort of brings me to my next question. Um, some of you alluded to it a little bit, but during this time of change, you as an entrepreneur approached it in a certain manner. How did you manage, uh, I know um, result for you guys is a little bit different because it's your husband and wife team, but maybe for the, you can jump in, but how did you, approach it for your team's sake? How did you lead your people um, during this time just to, as, as Johan said, um, to communicate ten, 10 times more than what you think is necessary? Um, how did you guys navigate that and how did you approach that to just keep your people secure and safe and sort of take them through that time of change? We're going to play Ching Chong Cha for this one. Um, Great question. I think that's the most important thing. If you've got a business where you've got a team, then again, it comes down to values and it comes down to culture. And I think there was a very old school way of doing business where executives and leaders in the business never discuss finance with the team because it's not for their ears, or they don't discuss strategy because it's not meant for everyone because someone might speak to someone outside of the business. And I think times are changing. The most important thing for me was to be 100% open and transparent. So we live according to values. We live according to excellence, stewardship, transparency, respect, integrity, and living um, godly values. So if you living according to transparency and accountability, I have to be transparent to my team and I have to, to let them keep me accountable to what we're doing. So the main thing was communication, but the important thing is communicating what? So communication is important. We need to communicate so that everybody's on the same page and so we're transparent, right? The difference between um, expectation, whether you've got a relationship, whether you've got a business, whether you're building a forecasting model when raising funds, whether you're building a model that's predicting consumer behavior, the stress is the difference between expectation and reality. If I'm an entrepreneur and I've put a too high valuation on my business, and now I need to meet those profit KPIs, stress is the difference between where I'm at and where, I, where I'm 
supposed to be my full cost. In my relationship, stress is the difference between how are we communicating or think we're communicating and how we're really communicating. In a business, stress is the difference between what is the actual climate in my business which I think and what is there really, right? And the closer we can bring expectation to reality, the more we can decrease our stress. So when communicating, the question is what do you communicate? And that is, where, what's the finances like? What's the salaries look like? Are we going to do any retrenchments? Are we going to do, have to do salary cuts? And for us, it was God's purpose is always equal to people. If, if you're living in a world where you think you can live God's purpose without living or speaking or dealing with people, then I think you're living a different gospel because God's gospel is always people. And for us, it was in that moment extremely important to nurture our team, to nurture the people. So I would rather take a personal knock and take the risk but ensure that I don't do salary cuts and I don't do retrenchments because I know my team more than money is the blood of my business and if I don't honor them and respect them in that moment and I I mean in this time we probably did about 500 prospects or pitches during lockdown to enterprise clients I met you on um, a while back at um, Woolworths and very excited in February, we were supposed to, we were starting to open up our business in India, employed our first business development reps, and literally two weeks later, lockdown. And that's over. I mean, we were there, everything was there, but we were busy pushing. We prospected two and a half thousand businesses in six months in India during lockdown with not one positive result. And then I realized is sometimes we need to understand the climate that we're living in. And often people don't just want to be sold to, they want to be led. So discerning the time in your business that you need to focus on, what's the one thing that you need to do? And for us, it wasn't selling. For us, it was being aspirational leaders and being a voice in the market where people desperately needed it. So that started becoming our focus. I think, uh, you know, whether you're raising kids or running a business, I always say about raising kids that, um, you know, you want to have a discussion with them about, um, not about what should I do, but about how should I think. And if I can get with my child to a place where they want to speak to me about how should I think, then that is, um, that's a great place to be. And, but when things go well, whether that's in, the, in that environment or in the business environment, it's very hard to have that discussion about how should I think. Because you're just, you know, you're flowing and there's momentum and you're making quick decisions and it's just what should we do, what should we do. Um, so, so one of the great opportunities in the COVID is, is exactly how should we think about this? And, and I think introducing that discussion, what Gwiba said at a very practical level, also equipping people to have uh, information available, but to have that discussion on a, on a deep level. So... Um, so that's the one side. And the other side is obviously, and it's very common sense, but it's, you know, you have to work on the relationship side now. So we just just started to check in on Zoom uh, three times a week. And sort of the rule is you don't speak business. I just want to find out what did you do over the weekend? I just want to find out, you know, where did you go last night? Or did, and, did, um, and, and, and that sounds like a very silly thing, but it actually helped us a lot. I would say that we have... <laughs> We know more about what the other guys do in their families now than we than we did before COVID. Um, so so that could be very positive. Um, it was very positive for us as well. Um, reiterate or, or to kind of add to what they're saying. I think communication is really is key. So even though Shane and I are married. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, and we and we spend huge amounts of time talking, and that's one of the things that we love doing, and just sharing ideas. During COVID, we we kind of maybe because I was just throwing myself into work, and Shane was we we actually found ourselves not communicating, um, which is quite kind of strange, really, because that's what we build our relationship on is communication. So to reiterate that, we kind of woke up <laughs> literally in the middle of the night and we're like, we haven't spoken, you know, because we've just been so busy doing other things. So I think even when you're a small team like we are um, and you're married, you know, um, talking to each other is really should take priority. And when we when we put that back into in place, whether that was sort of our more early mornings, because it's, it's sometimes we were actually just having these conversations while the kids were asleep and we were lying in bed, we were just talking, and it was like, oh, wow, this is great. So it <laughs> doesn't work with all your team members, I guess. But... <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but just to reiterate, I think communicating and just really asking, you know, and to your point, you know, what is it, um, what's happening in your heart, you know? So we, we obviously both believers and we love Jesus and we, we can do that. But um, we also found that with the teams that we were working with, that was the big thing that people were missing. So they were driving to meetings after meetings after meetings and the feedback that we were getting generally is that we, we're missing the coffee and just standing at the water fountain finding out how your dog is. Um, so we, you know, we also then advised our clients, you know, you just need to have those times where you check in on Zoom and you, you just don't speak business. You just want to find out how the person is. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Um, so I want to try and bring it a little bit more practical to the audience. Um, so obviously we know statistically during, during COVID, many, many small businesses had to close down. Um, guys lost up to 100% of their income for two, three, four months, um, trying to, to get um, head above water again. Um, so based on that, and obviously you guys have gone through many times of change. We change. We had the 2008 um, economic crunch. This is not the first time we've we've hit a crisis. Um, and someone I read it the other day. Someone said, "Please just don't let a crisis go past as an opportunity to to excel." And I think we've seen that there's many companies out there that's really taken this as an opportunity to to grow. Firstly, and and secondly, to to either pivot or just align yourself for, for future success. Um, so my question to you guys is just from your experience and just from the heart, we're sitting with business owners here, some busy with their own businesses, some aspiring, so, some st still in corporate, but having dreams to become uh, the, starting their own business. What during this time or during any crisis for that matter, would your, let's call it advice, your um, yeah, your advice be to them on how to maybe one, two, three things that they can practically take and apply during a time of crisis. Sort of your advice during this time and any crisis for that matter. Um, I think the analogy around um, the airplane, you know, with the, the oxygen that sort of falls down and they always say you need to put your oxygen mask on first before you help those around you, I think is really important. Um, and I think this is, whether it's in a crisis or not, um, this is certainly something that we're learning and growing in, is, is the whole idea of um, not running on empty. So I think in a crisis it's often exasperated, um, where, in my instance, where you just throw yourself into work, but you're not really tending to your heart. Um, and, you know, feelings of I'm not good enough, um, I don't have what it takes, um, um, going to the place of tending to your emotions I think is really, really important because you can come out of a crisis or you can come out of a huge amount of success and you can kind of lift your head and realize that you're actually empty. So I think um, putting your own oxygen mask on is really important and, and that... Uh, and I don't think this is just a woman's perspective, you know, looking after your emotions, um, but really it, it's about tending to what you're feeling and acknowledging that and not just pretending it's not there. So even when there's pain, going to that pain and kind of dealing with it, I think is important. Um, otherwise, even despite the the um, challenges that crises bring, you can even have a huge amount of success and get to the other side and feel like you've achieved nothing because you're actually just empty and you're emotionally empty. Um, so that's something that we're working on, something that I'm certainly working on. And I think that's a, a, a big part of our humanity. And I think that's how Jesus also lived. He was really in touch with who he is and in the moment. Um, because I think crises or life, we, we often don't live in the present. We either live in what could happen, the good. So sometimes we can even just think of these great things, which I think is good, you know, to have goals and stuff. Um, we can also live in the anxiety of, oh, my goodness, what can happen next month when our clients don't pay us? Or we can live in the past. I should have done this better. Or I should have done this better, as opposed to just living right in the here and the now. Um, so I think that would be my advice, whether you're in business, whether it's crisis or no crisis, is really just looking, and not a selfish kind of 
um, a selfish thing, but I really understanding that if I don't put on my own oxygen marks, I'm not going to have anything to give to my clients, to my team, to my spouse, to my kids. Um, uh, brilliant. What is that oxygen mask, though? So once I realized one thing, we went to an old age home to serve as a small group, and this old woman walks to the door, and she says, we were literally standing outside in the rain waiting for someone to open up the door. And she's, she comes there, and she says, you know what? I just had this feeling God called me to come open up the door. And she said something that profoundly shook my reality of the gospel. She said, every day I wake up and I present my day before the Lord. And he will, uh, he will uh, renew my thoughts and he renews my plans. And she walks away. That's it. That's all she said. And I thought about it and said, we, sometimes we are so fanatic about purpose, passion, right? I want to do something I'm passionate about. The reality is that the word passion means that one thing which I am willing to die for. So often as an entrepreneur, you always count what is the blessing, what am I going to gain from this, but we don't often enough count the cost. And with carrying our cross comes a massive cost. And we never say, well, what is that cost, right? So whether it's in a crisis or whether it's not in a crisis, if you've got a startup, you're basically in a crisis all the time. <laughs> There's always chaos. And the reality is that the first thing I started doing was every single day, the first fruits of your day, you give to God. And we always say this, but we need to be more diligent in this and actually apply it. How often do you spend quiet time? <laughs> did, you, did you follow the conversation between me and Johan now? No, because there was no conversation. Why? Because I wasn't asking any questions. So how can we say we're spending time with God if we're not sitting one-to-one -one with Him and asking Him the questions? And I literally started taking my diary every single day, looked at my day, on Sundays looking at my week, and started praying into those meetings, started praying into those conversations. The practical side of it, and this is something I've never done in my life before, praying that God's kingdom will come in that meeting, in this conversation, in this part of my business, right? So having practical strategy in place. And then... The second thing is now you've gone on your knees and you've given God, now he can steer the ship and give you guidance and give you mentorship. We always often go out and seek worldly mentors and businessmen that have actually made it, but we don't lock into the most amazing mentor of all time. And God wants to have that conversation with you. He wants to partner with you. In fact, it's his business. It's not yours in any way. And now a lot of times we go on in life, and we don't even ask our main shy shareholder what we should be doing. It doesn't make sense. So for me, that was the first thing. And secondly, it's now looking at a practical business perspective, move your business to where the money flows. We were kicking down doors and trying to bring this idea of what that we have to the organizational space about knowledge-focused learning and you know, increasing performance and decreasing OPEX by using learning as a powerful tool. And people are like, so what? We don't care about our people. And that's one thing we realize. Businesses in South Africa don't care about their people. They care about ticking BE boxes. They care about the scorecards. So what did we have to do? Take your business to where the money flows. CETA and SACWA accredited training. They're sitting with billions in budget, which they want to just give to people. And just God put it on our heart. Start aligning your business to where the money is flowing. So what it practically means for you, if a crisis hits, what happened? Just the distribution channel changed. If the crisis hits and your business is in such a position that there's no need for it, then there's probably no need for it. And Elon Musk, I don't like what he says often, but there's one thing what he says is amazing is, um, and in, in the, the startup funding culture in the U.S. is obviously much different to South Africa, but this makes 100% sense. He says, if you're a startup and you can't raise money, it probably means there's a startup out there that's got a much higher value offering than what you do. So give the funding to the startups that makes the most difference. Move your business to that, that area, distribution, or value chain where it's going to make the most difference and the money will follow. But move your business to where the money is flowing. And stop trying to kick your product into someone's door where there's no product market fit, where you believe and you've got your own, you know, you've got your own idea of why this is so important, but nobody's buying it. You know, sometimes we have to, and I had to do it personally. I had to drop my ego. I had to drop what I thought I was busy doing and allow God to move in my business. Very good.
that level of wisdom, yeah, um, between the two of them. You taught it to me, so. <laughs> so but I, I, I'd say that, yes, obviously at a practical level, as Scribus is also saying, you, you can have some strategic adjustments where you know that your business model is really affected by this and it's not going to come back. And then you have to pivot on a business model. Or it could just be tactical, where you say, look, I have to go overweight tactical now, just short-term cash flows, whatever I can do, because I'm just going to get through this period, but my business model is intact. So it's very, I think, important at the business level to discern between those two. Some things are not going to come back. It's, it won't have a life again, and you can't link to that. Other things will be fine. It's just the question of, of uh, getting through the storm. On the spiritual side, I think, obviously, um, it's very true that we don't live by faith willingly. Uh, we, we prefer not to have, need faith. Uh, you know, uh, maybe it's just me. But if, it's, you know, if, I, if I can get through the day without needing faith, then it would be fine because it would mean that everything's working okay. And, and, and this is what the time like this really does. And, and I like what Chris is saying about pressing in because, as you know, market share shifts in a recession uh, or it shifts in a, in a, in a war. Uh, this, is a, this is a period where market share will shift. Um, this is a period where we have the unfair advantage of being an insider trader where we can actually press in and find out what, 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 what God is leading us to do. Um, and I think I'm going to tear my hair out of one day of not having done that enough in retrospect when I look from, from heaven backwards and think, yeah, I had access to all of this. And um, so I think we're just scratching the surface on all of that. And then the last thing I'll say is that you know, when I, we've all been, gone through some tough times and there was an extended period of a really tough time in my life where I just really didn't hear God, to be honest. And... Um, but it was, when I was praying, it always felt like he was saying, look, I've got so much work to do on your character, I don't have time for your circumstances, you know, so, <laughs> so I, I, think, I think that is the thing, you know, we, in times like this, it shapes our character, and, um, and we don't want to hear it when we're busy with it, but we can see it in retrospect, and we must uh, focus on that. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's, that sums it up. Thank you very much, guys. That's really powerful and, and practical as well. Thank you. So at this point, I would like to give the audience a chance to, to ask a few questions. They're going to put you guys on the spot. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you guys can just answer a few questions from them. So anyone, if you raise your hand, I can just bring the mic out to you and we can do that for a few minutes. Sure. Nobody. You guys did such a great job, there's no questions. <coughs> on, to, on to what you, were, you guys were saying, it's um, at the end of the days I've learned through my life experience and what God taught me is that we almost often lick our own wounds and uh, we don't seek first the kingdom of God, we, we seek our own kingdom because your business is your kingdom in a lot of sense. And sometimes, I just want to latch on to what you were saying. We are always saying, uh, but this happened to my business or this happened to, to, to this. But according, if we look at God's perspective, heaven's perspective, and we look at, look at it that way, if God is, uh, and we're working all for, for Trinity PTY Limited or Heaven PTY Limited, and this is, and what we're doing here is the, the side projects that He wants us to do, where, where He say, listen here, I'm going to put you in a specific business opportunity, but sometimes failure is not failing in God's eyes. So that's also something God is busy teaching me, where we see failure and God sees I've done what I needed to do. And if we're looking out of that perspective, a God's perspective, sometimes we're not always going to see uh, um, uh, uh, victories and stuff in our own eyes, but it's a victory in God's eyes because he's moving things that we can't see. And uh, that is where I want to latch on to what you're saying. Go first to God and say, what's heaven's perspective of what I must be doing now? Because I can't see it. You can see it, and that's why we need to tap into that. And failure is not always failure. It's victory in heaven's perspective. That's where I just want to latch on to that. Sorry, I didn't want to ask a question. I just want to say that's something important. 
Thanks, Kirita. Good night, Prayakum. So I guess the question for me is really, um, how do you manage the balance between, because entrepreneurs generally have a high action bias, but how do you manage the balance between waiting on God and being sure of his leading and actually just acting and when to act? I think, <laughs> um, I think if you... So, your conscious mind can, let's say, um, process, let's say, 200,000 bits per second, where I'm thinking and I'm there and I'm strategizing and I'm on the page, where my unconscious mind can process 200 million bits per second. And that's the thing that where spiritual multiplication comes in for me. Um, if you are aligned... The problem in that situation is if you are not aligned with God's purpose in your life. Um, and it comes down to if I focused on what God told me this morning and I know what my strategy is and I am living in that strategy for the period that I'm in and I've got people that's praying for me, I've got mentors that are praying for me and guiding me, in the counsel of many wisdom is found. If I take the practical biblical principles and I apply that, praying for my business, having people keep me accountable, having mentors that can impart, coaches that can guide. I've got people praying for me. I've got teams that are focusing. Then we can move because we know we're aligned. And if something happens, sometimes, I'm not saying it always happens, sometimes it's we first have to sit and pray and wait for God, but sometimes the decision needs to be made in 30 seconds and you can't wait. I make that decision by discerning and focusing on the plan that I know that God has. And if you come boil down to the essence, there's, and I love this, to me this is, it fundamentally changed my life, is in kingdom business there's two areas to it. The one is, I'm feeling like Vaynon Smith now sitting next to you about two years ago. But anyway, there's, you get the kings and you get the, the prophets. And the kings go out and your role as a king and we always say, do you do business with the world? 100%. You do as much business with the world as possible, as much as you can. And you go out and you take money from the world and you bring it back and sow it into the kingdom. And the second is the prophet. And the prophet goes out and looks after the people and gathers the people and gathers the people so that they can go into the harvest place. So fundamentally, the first thing is, are you a king or are you a prophet? And walking in that and knowing what your identity is in business and knowing what your identity is in God. And if you make the decisions... God will move through that. And you will make mistakes. The world places this thing on us that says you're not allowed to make mistakes. We aim for perfection. And that's actually nonsense. You're allowed to make mistakes. You have to make mistakes. And if you make a mistake in your business, and let's say, for example, I give something to my team, and I say, once you've implemented this, look after X, Y, and Z. And if they come back to me and they say, oh, so, sorry, um, something went wrong, and I ask them, did you look after X, Y, and Z, or did you QC, quality control X, Y, and Z, and they say yes, then I say, excellent work. Now we know something more. Now we know there's A and B as well. But if you go out and you look at X, Y, and Z, and you didn't look at A and B and you knew about it, then it's on you. Then you're not being excellent in what you're doing. Then it is a mistake which you made. But if it was a mistake which you made and you didn't know about the outcome, you didn't know how to check for it, then it's not really a mistake. Then it's just growth. So I think we need to start focusing on that and really seeing the people in our businesses as well, identifying where we're at, allowing ourselves to be excellent and excellence is much different to perfection. And excellence is regardless of whether I'm sweeping the floor or building forecasting models, I will do it at the 100% best of my ability. But then stewardship comes in. And there's a massive difference to me between ownership and stewardship, where ownership is the car is mine. I cannot have ownership over Yuan's car because it's his car and he definitely doesn't want to give me ownership over it. Stewardship means I know what I am looking after might not be mine, but I know how much it means to you and how hard you've worked for it. And because of that, I will look after it as if it's my own. And I think if we, we're growing in those principles, then we will move and you'll make decisions and you're allowed to make mistakes, knowing that God does have your back as long as you're aligned to his purpose. Yeah, so I, I, I tend to oversimplify things a bit. And, and so obviously when we, when we sit in meetings and I, you know, I'm not the one that understands and I always say my rule is I just cut my age in half 
ask question at that level. If I still don't understand, I cut my edge in half again. And then somewhere along the line, you actually get an answer. So for me, in terms of the decision-making process, um, I have to just believe that, um, well, when God says, if Christ is in you, you can ask him whatever you want and, and you'll get it. It's a circular reference thing, like Excel, right? So it means he's in me, so in the first place, I'm not asking him something that he doesn't want to do. So I tend to think about decision-making uh, in the same way. I think if God is in me, then the answer that I will come at in the end is the answer that is his answer. So I, I, don't, I don't see a two-tier process. And hence, you know, I can, I can trust the outcome of that decision to go to action um, because I have to believe that he's in me. Um, it's oversimplifying it, I think, but it works for me, um, and 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 um, and I believe it to be true. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions? Who? There was a few hands just now. Okay. If I can just ask, if we can just um, for for the sake of time, stay to questions, please. Um, I asked the question last time, so maybe it's not a clever question. I just wanted to know if anybody wants to answer me, the guy in the middle or the, the wise guy on the right or the lady on the left, wise lady on the left. Um, just one of the greatest, maybe a better question is one of the greatest challenges an entrepreneur faces. I suppose there's no right or wrong question. It's just something I'm wondering about. And, so if I can just um, repeat Skalk, you asking what's the greatest challenge for, for them specifically? Yeah, so uh, if I understand correctly, he's asking the, your, your greatest challenges that you faced as an entrepreneur. I think if you're, entrepreneurs are found all over the place, right? In big corporates and starting up a new company. If you talk about the classic entrepreneurship of starting something, I think it's a loneliness that goes with it because you're seeing a picture that no one else is seeing. You're seeing a picture that someone may not be able to see for 10 years. And, and until other people can see that picture, you're going to have to chip away at it. And, and that is, I mean, that's, it's that, if you look from a spiritual side, I call it the faith gap. It's a gap between when you know what you're supposed to do and you're waiting for the evidence. And you know, when you're really young and you break the window, you know you've got to tell your dad that you don't know what's going to happen, right? So that faith gap is relatively small, it's five minutes. And then it moves on you in your life, where it becomes five years or 10 years, where you know you've got to do something, you see this picture and you've got to do it. And then when you get to some of the stuff that I, at 55 now, I, I, have a, I don't have any expectation of seeing it in my life. Um, and yet I see the picture as clearly as anything else. I know it's going to happen. So that gap moves on you on your, in your life. But in terms of entrepreneurship, it's seeing that picture, believing it's going to happen, chipping away at it and, and you're really lonely. I think that's a big challenge. And with that, I think comes, um, now I can't remember what I wanted to say. No, managing energy, managing stress. And one of my mentors, Andre Duplessis, um, is the financial director of Capitec. He once said, I asked him, does the stress ever become less? Because we've got this idea of utopia where one day you're gonna run this business and everything's gonna be smooth sailing and the money's just gonna flow and it's gonna be amazing, right? And I asked him, you know, how do you manage stress? And he says, the stress never goes away. It becomes worse and worse and worse. The only thing that changes is our capacity to be able to handle it. So having that mindset and capacity and growing your mindset and capacity and not seeing stress as something that needs to go away, but turning that stress around to feel our fire and feel our passions and you, let God use it to, you know, to build our character and to build our businesses. So that for me is definitely loneliness it is a very lonely journey, especially if you're a single founder, but managing stress and man managing energy is very difficult. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing is, is my beliefs. Um, and I guess where do I take those beliefs to be answered is, is my biggest challenge. So, and I'm not talking about rah, 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 you know, I'm so great, but what do I really believe about myself? And to face that and then to go to Jesus and say, you know, here's, because I, I find that that's the biggest thing that trips me up in, in our business is just what do I really believe about myself and what do I really believe about who God is? 
And, and, you know, I can say that I believe these things because that's the good thing to say, but what do I really believe at a sort of a gut level? Um, and then to just <laughs> go, Lord, this is not great what I'm believing here. Um, can, you, can you change that for me? Um, so thanks for the opportunity. Um, and I think thanks for the, for the great presentation from the three of you. My question is, so I'm a, I'm a startup entrepreneur. Um, so one of my biggest challenges is that I work alone, not by choice, obviously, because I don't have anyone that I, that I work with. I think the gentleman in the middle mentioned stress and your expectation versus your reality. So what I find quite a lot is my expectations are very high. And then, but my reality is that there are certain levels that I need to overcome for me to get to where I, I need to be. So how do you manage in terms of your stress management? Because I mean, sometimes it's it gets very frustrating. So how do you bring yourself down in terms of maybe like in a structural way to say, you know what, step by step, what, what, what do I need to do for me to achieve certain things? And again, from a partnering perspective, what do you say is the importance of having a partner in your business? And then if you were to maybe like guide in a few words, how would you go about finding a good partner or a good invest X, Y, Z? Um, because I'm really struggling at the current moment in terms of what, what I need to do and what route I need to take next. I, that question. <laughs> if I can go back three years ago, man, that is the most difficult and most important thing there is. Um, I think if you're currently, if you're a single founder, and that's exactly, I mean, we've gone through the journey in a very, very, very brutal way where I met someone I did not, and a lot of times investors do due diligence on businesses and businesses do due diligence on, on investors, right? But you hardly ever go and do due diligence on your partner. And in that space, if your partner is not kingdom focused and aligned to your values, do not climb into bed with them. It's much more difficult to get out of a business um, shareholding agreement than it is to get out of a marriage. If your shareholders don't want to leave, you can't do anything about it. So the moment you give shares to someone, the main question is always, are you aligned in terms of purpose? There's, you can still have a co-working relationship, step away from the partnership and still run business together without being partners, right? So for in our, in our business, we I literally went with a partner, Vidigimi 50-50, let's go change the world. And then all of a sudden, so we outsourced our development work to his development company. We outsourced our design to his design company. And then they were just gone. We gave them 50% of our business. It was me and him 50-50 against the world. And all of a sudden, there was no UAT or user acceptance testing. There was no quality control. Their work was really bad. So I never did the due diligence to see all these awards and all these accolades and everything that's coming out from the front, is it actually true? Are they actually as good as he, he says he is? And I've heard this story a million times, especially in tech and development, people partnering with dev houses and then just failing in partnership. So in that, doing your due diligence as an investor, as an entrepreneur, in any relationship to see, are you aligned? The other thing is never get into partnership with someone that can bring exa exactly the same thing that you are bringing to the table. You want someone that can bring something completely different that can focus on areas in the business while you are running. If both of you are gonna do the same thing, two trees will probably uproot each other. And that's where you really start clashing because now whose domain is it really, right? And even though it's a kingdom focused business, it still happens. So you need to find someone that can really bring something else to the table that's got a different wealth creation personality than you. If you look at the the ways entrepreneurs create wealth in business, you're either the mechanic, which is like Mark Zuckerberg, or you're the creator, um, like let's say Bill Gates, or you're the star like Oprah Winfrey, or you're the Lord, um, let's say like Pablo Escobar, or Donald Trump, you know, hard negotiators. So find out what that person's strengths are and how they can help you in your business. Um, and for your journey while you're alone, 
I would say, because I mean, we went through that shareholder tilt, we had to um, get him rid as one of our directors. It was, uh, I mean, you don't want to focus on this type of stuff while you're, in, while you're busy building a business, right? Then you need to focus on product and being tactical and, and finding route to market. Now all of a sudden you've got all of this fire behind you from inter, in, infighting in the business that's just causing chaos and that can sink a business. So in this case, now I'm running alone. So I never, I never really had a co-founder. And in that I learned that you're gonna become extremely lonely if you're not gonna be accountable to people. And a lot of times we think, I've got this amazing idea, this is my business, da, 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 and nothing happens. And a lot of times we are so focused on ourselves and so focused on our business that we forget that there's so many people out there that can keep you accountable. Get people to call you on your nonsense. Take your strategy to mentors, advisors. Speak to people who have done it before and have done it in the past that know that business, they can guide you. Always seek help and always seek counsel and have people keep you accountable to milestones. Even if you're running as a, go to someone that understands business and ask him, please, I want you to mentor me. Here's my plan, but come to the table prepared. Ensure that if you're in a mentorship relationship, don't just go to the mentor and ask him questions and come back and then you haven't implemented anything. Go with practical steps. Put down full costs in your business. Always measure time. Always measure what your output is. Always measure what you're actually doing. And have people keep you accountable to it and to your growth. And get the right mentors and advisors in place, at least at that point, until you get to the point where you can find a partner that can bring something into your business that actually just brings wealth and, and new fire and new passion into the business. That's my five cents. No, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think everything that I've seen from ownership uh, gets either enhanced or contaminated by ownership. So ownership is a very important decision. And in terms of someone investing funds, I mean, I, our saying is capital always has an agenda. Um, so, uh, and, and in, in our business, that's our calling as we believe we want to see how we can change that agenda to Christ. So the more capital we can touch, the more agendas we can change. But, um, but the principle is that capital always has an agenda. An agenda will bring people together. And, and greed is a big agenda. Uh, greed will bring people more powerfully together than most other things. If they agree that this is what they're contracting on, they're putting their money together, but they want to maximize the one-dimensional um, measurement. Um, so it's very important to discern that agenda when, you, when you're looking at partnerships and what and people investing in your business. Um, and, uh, and I think my takeaway from what Quibus is saying is, you know, it's a, it's a decision that you must take carefully, prayerfully, and, um, and if you're not sure, you don't do it. So I just want to add, so we... we um we obviously work with people, and um, we had two instances where people came to us and said they want to do partnerships, and, and so Shane always has this partnerships is, is a sinking ship, you know? <laughs> so that's his premise, you know, so we'll go in this, and this is, you, you need to really understand what you're doing when you're doing partnerships. And um, we did ass assessments with um, two lots of people, and it was interesting, we were able to highlight the red flags for them and said, this is, you need to understand, this is what you're like, this is what this person's like, with both of them in the room. Um, and in two instances, we, obviously we can't advise not to go into a partnership, even though, you know, we, ownership is a big deal. Um, but it came, it came out, they decided to dis, almost disregard what we, what we presented to them, which were really kind of red flags. Um, and about a year or two later, the, in both instances, um, it didn't work, and it was a values-based assessment to really look at what you value as an individual and if that aligns or not. Because uh, it, it's only uh, two cases, and um, we've never worked with any any more than that. But it's it's quite telling when the values don't align. And then the stress thing, there's, there's a lot, and I'd love to talk to you about how to manage the stress. And Quibus mentioned managing your energy is important. So, so often you'll just start off with how are you sleeping? Um, what kind of nutrition are you having? Are you exercising or some of the basics? And then there are a lot of quick hacks that you can do when you're in a situation and you feel your anxiety rising or your stress levels rising that you can do. So breathing is really important. The way you, your posture are, are kind of hacks that can help you to um, reduce your your stress levels by sort of tapping into your um, parasympathetic nervous system by kind of putting the brakes on. So there are ways of doing that, but it is about managing your energy and, and how you look at that. 
um, through various things. So I'm happy to chat to you about that afterwards. Hi. In the in the Bible, there's a lot of front runners that get um, th that always get faced with the question, "I'm not good enough to do this." Like God asks Moses to do what he does, and he says. I can't. He looks at his own faults. I can't. The Israelites, he says, go to the promised land and they look at their own lack and they say, I can't. As entrepreneurs, as a front runner, you're obviously faced with that a lot. N not necessarily what can my business not do, but me as a person. Like, what are my lacks? Um, that voice, we've all heard it. Like, does that voice get less the, the longer you're in business? Um, is it easier to ignore it? Um, and how do you cope with that voice of, I can't actually do this? Like, I have this vision, I have this dream, but my lack is just too big. I, I think for me, um, that is the best place to be. Um, you know, so that's actually the, the times of my life when I didn't do that well was when I actually thought I had something to offer. Um, and then, uh, and then God had to show me that I didn't have that much to offer. In fact, I don't have nothing to offer. So I once sat with a gentleman, and I'll come back and answer your question, who said, you know, there are three phases. First, you work for God. Um, and I, I thought, yeah, I know that. I know how to be a good pharmacist for God. And then you work with God. And I thought, yeah, I know how to do that. I go into a turnaround, and I don't know how to, this works. And I keep asking God, well, should I listen to this guy, or is this right, or what should I do? And he says, but between phase two and three, all the rules change on you. Because then God wants to work through you. And for him to work through you, you have to be dead. Um, and, um, and that dying, I think, is a very good process. So it's not a lack of, um, latch on to Rizal, it's not a lack of you know, uh, self-confidence. So it's just a, a very, hopefully, mature observation that you don't have much to give. Um, and, and I think it's a very healthy place to be. Actually, it increases my confidence because I realize that it's not dependent on me. It's, I'm, I'm, my only contribution is availability to run into the position. So the only play I have here is position. Anything but position is God's play. Um, and so, so it didn't get, in fact, it got worse in my life, not better, because you work more and more with stuff that you don't, that you know you can't do anything about. And uh, someone said a quote this week: uh, "Don't, don't allow thinking about what you can't do to impact with what you can do. And what you can do is you can be in the position and see what God wants to do through you." No, yeah, amazing. I mean, if you look at Gideon, if you look at Moses, if you look at David, God comes and uses us where we, where we're the most weak so that he can be glorified. And I think that's the, the encouragement we get from the stories. Um, I mean, imagine being a little boy, David's age, and facing Goliath. You know, I fought the lion, I fought the bear, and I'm going to fight this guy. So I think God gives us the strategy and the capability and the capacity, although we might not feel that we do. Moses had it. The first thing was just that he didn't trust God that he was good enough, right? So it's either out of self-pity that you're stepping and saying, well, woe is me, I can't do this. And you start feeling sorry for yourself because of your situation, right? Like Gideon did in the cave. And I think there's a, a strong element there that we literally in that moment submit everything in front of God. And so, well, if it's according to his plan, right? And a lot of times we think, is this according to God's plan? I mean, God will start moving and showing you things through counsel, through mentorship. And if you know that is the right thing to do and you've, got, you've discerned the situation, then I 100% believe that if you ask anything according to will of the Father, it will be so. And exactly what Johan said, if you are dead to yourself, if, and the biggest journey here as well as I say, you know, business and finance, if, if it really is not about you, and it's about God's kingdom and his purpose, and you are 100% dead, the, the, Bob, the Bible promises us, it's not a, God just put it there because it's a light suggestion, it's the truth. If you ask anything according to the will of the Father, it will be so. So the question then is, is this according to the will of God in my life? Is this what God wants me to do? And if so, it will be so. And you have to believe that, then trust God to come in and have faith that he will take you to where you need to be and bring the right mentors and coaches and advisors and people into your business that will help you. So I just want to just add to that. I think 
we all have these deep questions in our hearts. You know, do I have what it takes? You know, do, can I bring my, my beauty? Can I bring the sort of irreplaceable role that I have to play in God's bigger story? And I think our biggest mistake is to take those questions to our business to answer or to our clients to answer or to our spouse or our kids to answer for us. So I think it really is, to, to their point, is really bringing that question to God and saying, you know, what do you say? And just recently I was kind of working with this uh, I'm not enough story and um, in a journaling process it was God was showing me that he's going to remove the, uh, what is the the holding wall that in a building that holds up the wall, the main wall, I don't know, whatever, you know, the main wall that holds up the structural wall. And I just sensed God was going to remove that I'm not enough wall that I was building my life on. And he was going to replace it. And he said he was going to replace it with, I am your enough. You know, so every time I have that question coming up, oh my word, I'm, I'm not enough. It's just can lean into the fact that God is replacing that wall in my heart to say that he is my enough. So I think it's really important that we take those questions continually to Jesus and not have outside things answer it for us. Sorry, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask if you, um, just on a practical level, if you start something up as an entrepreneur, a lot of projects that you start up, is it's a, it's a passion project. It's something that you love doing it's something that you've been interested in and then I think what what often happens is these things you you experience more growth maybe than what you expected or it suddenly becomes a lot bigger than than you as an entrepreneur as a small business as a, yeah as something that you didn't necessarily think is going to be a big business that that you can handle um, and I think I, a lot of times when that happens like things start uh, deteriorating in in that environment and in that business and like I was just wondering like how do you how would you counter that so businesses uh, are well, very much like individuals, right? So businesses in different phases need different things. And um, and we love working in that space where, where businesses have grown up and they're teenagers and they now need to become adults. And that is a painful process for a teenager to become an adult. Um, so in that process, there are certain very practical things that you need. I mean, you need to know how to put a management team together because in, when businesses are smaller, you know, you, you can make sort of, you can be a little bit of a finance guy now and a little bit of a marketing guy then, and, and then suddenly you realize, okay, I need to put a, a, a you know, a team together. Um, so I, I think counsel is very important to get the right people to come alongside because it's very normal um, for, a, for a business that's successful to actually look at this and say, I have no clue how to get from where I am right now to where I'm going to get next. And it is like step changes, you know, sometimes you can just... Um, continue incrementally and sometimes there's a, there's a big step. That, that's a big step. Um, so I, I, I think it will be important to, to have discussions with people, not just make a list of 10 or 15 people that you want to have discussions with of the type of business that have gone through that recently and just take notes of what people have done and out of that see what crystallizes for you and, and try and put that in place. But, but, but definitely you're going to need a few people around around you for sure it's a good problem to have if a project turns into a business um usually people actually just run projects and think it's businesses and then it's not really a business so is the product market fit if there's people that really want to buy a product and it's meaningful and it adds value to their life and that's what they want a lot of times we chase our own agenda and chase our own passions where it shouldn't have been a business in the first place and we were disobedient to what we're doing i did it six times in my life where I chased the project and for the wrong reasons as well, for the money, not for the purpose, right? Um, but I think if you're in that growth phase, so obviously the most important thing to growth is you've got two elements. The one is, well, I'm sustainably growing good in, well enough so that I get enough income into my business so that I can fund it myself. Or I've got a great idea, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's a great concept, it's extremely scalable, but I'm going to need money to run with this. The stress is created by resources. So if you've got a lack of resources, but now you need to push 
certain outcomes. If you don't have resources coming to the inflow, then you're not going to have a great outcome. Either you're going to burn out yourself because you're doing too much, or your business is going to fail because you can't execute. So in that moment, then you probably have to raise funds. So then it's finding investors that are aligned to your, your values and your purpose and what you're trying to change. And um, so capital, either I can make enough money by doing this and I need to find the right people or I need to find the right funders who can allow me to, to create that capacity in my business to actually bring it in as a business. And it's, I mean, when you're raising money, the most important thing is always raise enough to what you need. Build out your plans, forecast your business, build a rudimental business model saying, well, this is my, my profit and loss, this is my OPEX, this is my CAPEX, this is what's going to happen in the next year. And even if it's just rands and cents, build that model. And that will then align and show you what you're busy doing. That's one of the most amazing exercises we did in our business is literally timing everything. Timing how long it takes to make coffee, timing how long it makes to actually run code, timing how long I can literally cost my business down to the rand and if someone asks me, give me a quote. So understanding exactly what the mechanics is operationally in your business, now you know what you need, you know how much it costs, and you know how much it can create. And that essence becomes, that becomes a thing of beauty as you grow it and nurture it. But if you don't have that yet, then it'll be a dangerous point to call it a business, because you don't know if it's sustainable. Because the key to business is staying in business, sustainability. So building that sustainability model and understanding it is probably the most important first step for me. Um, I think I'm going to quickly post a question, and Ross, if you'll excuse me, I'll, I'll repeat your question of last time, but I think it, it stays a relevant one. As entrepreneurs, we, we tend to really get so entrenched in the business 24-7. Just it's a never-ending kind of uh, process that never stops seven days a week, 365 days a year. How do you balance that um, in a healthy way between family and business um, and just maintaining that balance and making sure you're not burning yourself out firstly, I think, and secondly, just maintaining that healthy balance with family and friends and, and people around you. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I don't like rules, but um, rules have a place um, and, and rules uh, hopefully is just a temporary measure. So if I make a rule for my children when they are small that you need to look someone in the eye and say thank you, then hopefully that doesn't stay a rule for the rest of their life. Hopefully at some point they start to appreciate that it's actually a very positive experience. It actually makes a difference and it becomes a culture. Um, so I think we need to make rules for ourselves. Um, so I, I had a rule, I, I'm gonna have dinner with my family every evening. So it doesn't really matter. Um, when I was over here at Sipla, um, Jacob Zuma invited me for dinner on the 18th of October and I, it's my daughter's birthday, and I said, I, unfortunately, I can't make it. It's my daughter's birthday. So, so I think if you make rules, it doesn't, there's no good or bad rule. Just make rules for yourself so it becomes part of your culture. Then, then that is that, you know, you live it and, 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 and it's embedded. Um, I think on that, it's the one thing we can learn from Daniel is what was different from Daniel to any other person that's lived in the Bible. I mean, Moses had compromise. David had compromise. If you look at Gideon, he had compromise. If you look at Jonah, he had compromise. If you look at most of the characters in the Bible, compromise something. Solomon compromised something. All the great kings in Israel compromised something. But the one thing about Daniel, he was a man without compromise. And I think the moment you start compromising on your values, then you're in a very dangerous place. And it's important to determine, and you said it now, now, it's to get from where you are to where you want to be, you first need to decide where you want to be. So if you want to be someone that's overworked, extremely rich, and no family and friends, then build that lifestyle, right? If you want to be someone with great depth of relationship in your family, being a great father or mother to your kids, having great relationship with your, um, with your uh, siblings and with your parents and your family, being discipling someone or being as disciple, then we need to plan for that. We need to make it part of our growth journey. And if you just focus on the business, then excellent, but that's all you're going to grow in. So you're going to leave all of the rest behind. And as much as I thought it's so important just to grind and grind and grind, that burns you out. So 
And like I said, in areas, I think it's important where you're going to be in seasons, and I think discerning the time and the season is important, knowing that now is my season to graft, but then this is going to be the rules of engagement, and this is how long I'm going to do it for. I need people to keep me accountable to, are you exercising? Are you sleeping? Are you eating well? Are you spending time with your wife? Um, are you, and I think the most important thing here is keeping Sabbath. So not having one day... Sticking to godly biblical principle, having one day where you rest, and on that rest day, you rest. And I struggled with that literally up till 2020. Was I, I was literally always on, on drive, always pushing, always pushing, always driving. And it makes the people around you mad. So, I mean, this is the first time in my life I came to the, the opportunity to actually say whatever... I could never switch off on a weekend. No, no, Friday, come four o'clock. Whatever happened, happened. And none of the thinking in the world is going to change it. You're going to go on the weekend and you're going to rest. And as those thoughts come in, right, you have to take it captive, being practically biblically, saying, well, I'm captivating this. Keep out. You're not welcome here. Now I'm busy with this. And I think we, in, a, in a world where we're so multi-focused and busy, now I'm on WhatsApp while I'm actually in the meeting and I'm looking on my laptop while I'm... So we, we're not anywhere, actually. You think you're there, but you're not there. So for me, the biggest challenge was staying on the page and focusing and planning out to get from where you are to where you want to be. You first you decide where you want to be. What's your plan? So building in that balance... And focusing on goals, building relational goals, building mental goals, building physical goals, building spiritual goals, and going for those goals, and not just focusing on business, otherwise you will burn out, you will drown, or you'll just you know, progress in such a way that you're going to leave everything behind. Um, so I agree with, I uh, love what they've, they've both said, and there's certainly principles that we've, we've applied, and that there are certain rules, and I think... Um, for me, the biggest thing has always been when I find myself going into overdrive is the question is, am I trusting you, Lord? Because often when I find myself going into that space of just, you know, throwing myself into that, my, 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 um, my focus has shifted to it's, it's up to me to make this happen as opposed to just being in a place of rest. And last two questions. Oh, hi. I have a question. I'm sure you guys, as entrepreneurs, you do have competitors, right? Like, um, how do you identify your competitors and what makes your businesses different from your competitors? Do you have an easier question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. Um, no, again, I, I oversimplify, right? But I, I, I've said often that, um, you know, I don't really mind what the competition do because, you know, ultimately it's about finding your spot and your identity and then watching them, either the market share flow at you or away from you. But, but I think it, it's, it's, it is, for me, it's a conviction starts with what you're supposed to do. Obviously, you take the landscape into account and you take the competition into account, but in, in, in the business that I'm in now, in the second half of my career, my, my competition is mammon. You know, so it's not a physical competition, it's a competition about what is the purpose of capital and what does it produce and is it a currency that's eternal or is it a currency that is only has value in this life. Um, so I think about that a lot at that level, um, uh, but, um, but in terms of you know, competition at a, at a lower level, I want to say a more tactical level, I don't, you know, I, I, I think it has limited value to spend too much time on the competition. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if, and maybe it's the type of business we're in, so we're not initially, you know, selling fruit, you know, and have to compete with pick and pay and food lovers and Woolworths, so I, I guess that would be different. Um, but I think just to, to Johan's point, understanding that God has brought us into this place and this is our purpose kind of gives us a lot of peace around there's enough. So I think oftentimes when, you know, if I'm worried about the competition in a sense, it's almost like understanding that there isn't enough, but really just leaning into Jesus and knowing that there is enough for us to be able to do what we're doing. So there's a purpose and an understanding that there, there's enough. I think it's important to differentiate between fear of your competition. So looking at what they're doing and then you're afraid of saying, oh no, they're gonna 
you know, they're going to kill us. They're going to cut our throats off. You know, they, they're taking too much market share. Um, as a young startup, and I mean, we're still in the infancy stage, right? So a, a business is like a kid. You're growing a, a, it's a, it's a regulatory body by itself. It's like a little baby that you're growing. And I think it's very important. I mean, any mom would look at other kids and say, but he, you know, he's crawling like this and she's speaking like that. And it's important to look at, to benchmark where you're at in your growth, to understand, are you growing faster or are you growing slower than your competition or people around? Because if, if you're growing slower, if the element of change on the outside becomes greater than the element of change on the inside, then you're in trouble. Because then things are changing faster on the outside than inside, right? Um, so for me, acceleration, if you think about force, wind moves from a high to a low pressure environment. So are you the high or the low pressure environment? Is the wind moving towards or away from you? Is the wind pushing you or is it, is it pushing back against you? So we've learned so much from our competitors. Our competitors are actually you know, paving our way for us to do things differently because now we've already got our target market. We know where we're good at. But now I can look at all the tech startups in New York and in San Diego and you know, all around California and see exactly what they're doing, what they're raising, um, why they are raising it, what they're building, what kinds of teams are they building. I'm watching them from an operational perspective. I'm seeing what they're doing. I'm looking at the mistakes they're making and I'm learning from it so that I don't have to do the same. So they're literally paving the way for us because I'm looking at companies that raised capital let's say in 2007 and I can see throughout the maturity levels, I'm watching them, I'm seeing how they're growing, I'm seeing what they're doing. So use that as market intelligence. It's the best market intelligence you will have is watching your competitors that are great in what they do because they give you insights to your own business. It's great going to, I mean, I can go to Johan and he's going to give me amazing insights, but he's not going to necessarily tell me about accelerated edtech and how to build my platform in a specific stack, right? So where am I going to get that deep insights from and watch your competitors? But don't let that create fear for you. Let that create... Um, you know, passion for you and use that to drive your business, focus on what they're doing right, focus on what they're doing wrong and grow in that. And I think that's an amazing indicator you can use. Just out of respect for you guys, I know you guys are on a tight schedule and you need to go. Do we have time for one more question? Okay. I just want to know, um, you talked about um, mentors and things like that and, 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 and investments that you've made in your business. On a, on a spiritual kingdom um, perspective, investment like um, maybe mentors or, or um, uh, people praying for it or, or staff that you, that you, I've heard of people getting people on staff and, 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 and paying them just to be a spiritual advisor or, or something. In your individual business that you are managing and, and, and have, what investment have you done in that sort of way where you've brought kingdom totally in your business and there's a, a, it's a way of, of guiding what's happening inside of the business? Now, I'm not just talking about your own because you're doing your own thing, but what have you invested in the business? That's a brilliant question. Um, Firstly, if you're getting investors into your business again that's not focused or aligned with the values, you're in trouble. And in the same way, I think at the beginning of a business, and I had, the, I had a few rules in my business that I'm never going to fire someone, and I'm only going to employ people that are saved. And I think Johan said I'm being egotistical. It's not going to happen. Because the thing is, especially in the beginning of your business, you need to be tactical, right? You need to shoot everything that comes up. Where the strategist looks at the long run, but the tactician looks at what's in front of him and he recalibrates his scope to shoot at different distances, right? So I think in that, it's extremely important to bring in the right talent into your business. So people that can actually do the job, regardless of whether they're kingdom focused, saved or not, because God will use them in your business as long as their values are aligned to what you're busy doing. So for me, that was a very, I needed to learn that lesson in my business. But then after you've stabilized, and after now you've got, let's say your OPEX, your recurring revenue as a percentage of OPEX is 100%, um, you can, you've got options. You can afford to look at different elements in your business, and now you can start bringing in strategic kingdom focused directors or partners or investors or advisors and 
always have someone, I mean, obviously, you know, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the rules and principalities of evil. If you bring this back to the word, what does the word say about what we're doing? So have people that constantly pray for your business. And if, if you can first do that without paying them, I, you know, great. And then after a while, if you can bring in the right blood into your business that can then strategically, after the tactical game is done, right, there will always be a tactical game going. And then after a while, the strategy will start taking over the tactician's role. And the strategist comes in. And that's where the, and it's amazing that you're saying exactly where we're at now is great. We've stabilized. Now, who do we bring into the business that can actually take this business forward? And there, having the right people pray for your business is essential and keeping you in line with your purpose and, and your values and your goals and understanding where are we moving towards. And if you're finding mentors, go find a person. And this is an amazing thing which I've noticed from kingdom-focused mentors. Um, and I can honor you on in this, absolutely incredible. You will see whether the person you're speaking to, whether it's him or whether it's God flowing through him. And if you see so much of the person, then you know, be weary because look at how they, they manage their own personal finances. Look at how they manage their own personal relationships and look at what the things they do and say in their own business. If you can see God in that, then it'll be an amazing mentor to you. If you can't, step away. Even though they are successful, even though it looks everything looks amazing, if you can't find that value um, connection, then it can be very dangerous. So practically what I've implemented is mentorship in the phase we're in, finding kingdom-focused mentors that I meet with on a regular basis, and in different phases, it's different people, right? So finding what do you need um, on a spiritual level, on a physical level, from a business level, identifying who the people are that will have that type of knowledge. And then you go and seek them and you ask for wisdom and counsel. Raise your hand to listen, would you mind mentoring me? And then sometimes they don't always have to be for different strokes for different folks, right? So for different areas in your business, you don't always need a kingdom-focused business as long as it's aligned. If you look at what happened to Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, it's th Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews and they, he did three things. Firstly, he started teaching them the language and the education of the Chaldeans. And Daniel filtered that and said, well, I can filter that through my current logic and what my godly reasoning is behind it. So I can use the good things, but I can filter that. And you can always do that in your business. The second thing they did was they started um, um, treating them differently. They stayed at a different location. And uh, let's say they started eating differently. Now, what Daniel did there was he said, well, you know, I can't say, well, I can eat this bird and I can't eat that bird and this I can't touch. He just said, well, let's go straight, just give me vegetables. And there comes that discernment to say, well, do you need vegetables or do you need meat? No, I can't eat the meat, so all I'm going to take is vegetables, and not to compromise in that. So having the agility then to say, well, now in this phase of my business, I can ask someone that's ungodly about marketing strategy and let them guide me and mentor me in that because I can filter that through my godly values. Versus I get someone in my business that's now practically involved in the business and he's sitting on the board and he's got insight and shareholding in my business. So we decided, well, we're not going to take a cent more from someone that doesn't have kingdom focus. Because as um, Johan said, capital comes with the agenda. So one, only seeking investment from people that are aligned with our purpose and our conviction and our values and has got kingdom focus business understands that. Secondly, bringing in the right mentors in the right time for us, for what we need practically now today. And for us, that is people that understand business development, that understand marketing, and they can give me insights in that. But thirdly, now I'm looking for new development, I'm looking for new management, I'm looking for new directors to come in. And then I say, practically, where do I need to grow? I need to grow in business development. I need to grow in my funnel. I, we, we in our growth phase now where we're going to start scaling. So in that, who do I need? I need a, a, someone, I need to be able to multiply myself so I can focus on business and have someone else focusing on the development and the team so that I can just focus on R&D. So that's basically what I needed in the, in the season that I'm in. And that's what we implemented. And ensuring that person is in 100% aligned to values. Yeah, so I think it has huge context, depending on where you are. So first of all, I can hear listed companies all of that. They have a certain strategy and certain things that you can do and cannot do. Where we are now, uh, where we're managing capital and we can be explicit about the fact that it's for Christ, stewardship, how do I implement that practically while signing in a way that shares with my company. So 90% of it in the Christian trust, uh, kept 10% for myself, and then later decided I don't really know how I can justify keeping the 10. So our companies are over 100% by our charitable trust. And hard codes, so my name is not on the share register anymore. Um, and that makes it practical. 
they, you know, um, for the people, no closed office there, open offices except one, is a shareholder. Because the shareholder is a place where you can go and speak to the shareholder if you want. So it's small things that you do in your business that just hard go and, and make people understand. And then uh, recently, a couple of years ago, I realized you know, for my uh, privilege of growing up with my mom, I had a mom, a terrific dad, but a mom that's an intercessor. So uh, throughout my career, I, I would call and say, I've got a board meeting tomorrow, you know, at 8 o'clock, just be sure to be playing. And I realized that, I realized that, you know, I have this luxury that is everything happens in the spiritual before it happens in the physical. So I'm actually operating at a strategic level. Someone that's not even on the company payroll is doing all the hard stuff, which is reaping the benefits here. So I had to bring that into the business and say, okay, you know, by the way, it's what my mom has been doing. We have to complement with my the team. So find another person with my mom. And this is how we can get filter and get the, you know, the, the uh, prayer request through to that side. So I think the context matters. You obviously you can't do that in a Western company. But then, you know, I won't go there now because that's a different strategy. Guys, I think uh, we've come to the end of the of the morning. I come bearing gifts. Um, just, uh, I can't think of a better way to have spent uh, this morning. Um, I'm not an entrepreneur myself, but what an inspiring and just wisdom-filled morning. It was really phenomenal just to, to listen to the three of you and just to gain um, some wisdom some inspiration and above all encouragement in the difficult times that we've been through. So, you know, just on behalf of, of City Gates and, and all of us, we just want to thank you immensely for your time and just your congruency and your realness this morning. It is really a, an amazing time. So something uh, small to show our appreciation. Can we give them a hand?